Okay. Hi there. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll do some introductions. Please. So, uh, I'm making this podcast for the, the students at Port Angeles High School in the school district, and I'm hoping to share this with more people, uh, likely, uh, since this weird time we're kind of in need of content, but not too many people producing. So I've kind of gone around asking all the people that I admire and respect in different fields that have different um, areas of specific expertise uh, to maybe give us some uh, material to work with for our students. Uh, if you would go ahead and kind of tell us who you are and how you make music, uh, that might be a great way to start our conversation and direct this particular podcast for the students. Okay, well, thanks for inviting me. Uh, my name is Greg Utes, Y-O-U-T-Z, and I am a composer. Uh, I'm also a professor of music at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington. Um, and I've been teaching there for 36 years. So for 36 years, I've been dealing with students face to face in the classroom. And all of a sudden, here I am, like everybody else, trying to figure out how to teach <laughs> online. <laughs> well, the, one of the reasons that I reached out to you in particular is I was already thinking of who's a composer that would be, you know, gentle with uh, kids and providing a, an approach that would make sense to someone who's never thought about making music. And I saw you had this interview on uh, transitioning to digital learning. And I was like, perfect, I'll get Dr. Utes. <laughs> That's right. So one well, of the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say that also, um, I, I'm not only a composer, I am, I am proudly an ex-bassoonist. Uh, so for many, many years, decades, I played bassoon. And, and I, I still feel very strange that I'm not an active bassoonist these days, but I just want to sort of let your, let your students, uh, whoever's watching this know, uh, that I, of course, was and to some extent still am a, a performer. So I know what it's like to be without your group and, yeah. and wondering, you know, what do I do with my viola or my clarinet or, you know, without my orchestra or my band? Um, I mean, it's like, is there anything a musician can do all by themselves? And I think that's part of what this is about. Um, and so, yeah, I, I have some ideas on kinds of things that we can do. Well, that's my first question is you're a musician and your whole identity, especially for many of my students at our school with the program that we have, a big part of their identity is that I am an orchestra student. So they're still an orchestra student. We still have school more or less, uh, but that identity is kind of uh, <clears throat> see-through right now. So <laughs> right. How does a musician find identity when they don't have an ensemble? Yeah. Well. I'd like to ask your students a, a kind of a deep question. And that question is, to what extent are you a musician in an orchestra because you love your instrument and you love the music? Mm -hmm. And to what extent are you a musician in an orchestra because you like the social activity of making this sound mm -hmm. together? And the latter we cannot do at the moment. I mean, you could mock it up with a kind of a, you know, go online and find a computer accompaniment and play along with it. These kinds of things exist, but that's not the same thing. And you know it and I know it. Um, so that leaves us with the first part of being a musician, not the social activity of, of making music with your friends and enjoying the, being in the middle of, of making this sound, but rather you as a musician, trying to produce to the best of your ability beauty in sound mm -hmm. right and and also understanding that as a classical musician more than in jazz or in popular music as a classical musician you are serving the music mm -hmm. it's kind of what we do right i mean we get the music somebody's already composed it it's published it's printed the conductor has studied it. We show up ready to play. And then, you know, what are we playing? <laughs> and so, so, you know, I think, I think the often, and I remember this very well from my days as a bassoonist, very often we can play the notes and we know maybe through listening to a recording or maybe because our conductor has told us, we know how to play it right, right? So more or less the music has already been made. Right, the music has been made and we're supposed to kind of replicate it. Mm -hmm. But the question is, how much do we actually know about this music that we're trying to play beautifully? 
And maybe this is something that we should be investigating during this kind of ensemble timeout. What are we actually playing and how do we play it beautifully? I was just on, uh, there's a great group on Facebook for orchestra teachers uh, in the country. Uh, and we throw some ideas around all the time. And uh, I was hearing a few people talking about cool things coming out of this time. And uh, somebody out in the Midwest is just scheduling 15 minute lessons with each student throughout the week. Mm -hmm. And that we never would have time for that regularly. Right. So despite the inconvenience of not having regular rehearsals, it opens this opportunity to explore a lot of the things that we wouldn't have had time for, like music analysis, maybe even some composition, maybe we'll get to that today, yeah. uh, and e examining the music at a deeper level. I think a lot of my students don't even know the composer to a lot of the pieces that we play. They just know it by the title. Exactly. So just exactly. getting into that could be a, yeah. a, a, a deep dive for them. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to suggest, and getting back to the idea of lessons as sort of a timeout thing to do, um, I'd like to encourage students to move beyond what I think is the habitual kind of student approach to lessons and, and to just your own uh, playing and improvement of your playing, which is to say, oh my gosh, I've got a lesson on Tuesday, I better practice really hard on Monday, right? And because I've, oh, yeah. <laughs> I've got to pass this test with my teacher and not look like an idiot. Um, or, you know, for those of you who don't take private lessons, but just come to orchestra twice a week or whatever you do, you know, suddenly the night before orchestra rehearsal, you quickly dash through some things and hope you don't mess up too badly in front of your friends. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe this is the time for us to really take stock of, of our own responsibility to our playing. For instance, um, many of us would much rather play our licks from Tchaikovsky or Borovsky <laughs> or whatever than we would practicing scales, right? Oh yeah. So scales and arpeggios, and sounds like, well, it's kind of like hard work. I can't wait to get to the good stuff. But what I'm suggesting is, if you were to think about playing an A major scale on your cello and, and playing it in such a way that every single note was incredibly expressive, could you, in fact, play your scales at various tempos and, and your arpeggios, could you play them gloriously, beautifully, <laughs> sensitively. Could you play an A major scale so that it sounded heroic? Could you play one so that it sounded like you were deeply in love and telling somebody how much you loved them? Could you play that same A major scale as though you were full of joy? Why not? And then do the minors. Could you make an A minor scale sound scary, ferocious? Could you make it sound sad? Could you make it sound tender, nostalgic, right? Choose these kinds of words and play your scales with these kinds of things in mind, taking into account that you're gonna shape a phrase out of this maybe two octave, three octave scale, and it's gonna begin and it's gonna build and then it's gonna sort of finish in some amazingly musical way. I mean, there's a way to, to, to do something all by yourself without your ensemble that will make you a better musician so that when we all get back to our ensembles, we'll look at each other and go, wow, what happened to you? You sound fabulous. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All righty. So uh, that, that's sort of an introduction to the, the kind of conversation we are going to be having today. Uh, just as a starting point, uh, I want to know, how did you make the transition to digital? What kind of resources did you need? Uh, and maybe also some uh, perspective from maybe feedback you've had from your students on how they got used to this format and any bumps you you found along the way. Uh, just kind of a, a, a quick summary of, of that transition. Yeah. Well, in the, in the musical field, um, of course, there's sort of unique technology that, that has been developed and, and, and we all learn to use, and, and so that has been terribly useful. Um, we have course websites at PLU, probably the way you may have class websites in high schools, um, and some teachers are more kind of hip and into that, and some really not so much. Um, I found in some ways I was very lucky to have gotten into it about five years ago and spent quite a bit of time putting a lot of my course content online on these course websites, which allowed me to do what educators call flipping the classroom, 
which mm -hmm. means instead of me standing in front and telling students stuff every day and them writing it down, instead the content is pretty much available on the website. And then mm -hmm. my job in the classroom is to get them to do something with it, talk about it, uh, try stuff. In the case of music classes, go up to the board and write some stuff on the staff lines on the music paper uh, on the board, and then you know everybody sort of talk about it and fix stuff. And so, um, so I, I have been able to uh, use the technology to basically deliver the, the, the basic information or techniques or whatever. Uh, and then students are able to interact in a classroom. So I find that we're still able to do that. The students still have the content on the website. Um, they are still able to interact and, and um, I, I can share my screen with them, for instance, during a video conference so they can see the, the student assignment that I have pulled up on my okay. A computer and then everybody can talk about it and we can even play it. We're still struggling to get good sound uh, but but I think we're beginning to solve that one platform over another platform or something. And then of course I think what's really really cool is in the music world itself uh, there of course have been music software for many decades uh, for notation of course for tuning your computer into like a recording studio for pop songs and stuff. So we all know about those things. Many of those are quite complicated and many of them are very expensive. Um, but what's been amazing is this notation program in the last four years or so called MuseScore. MuseScore. <laughs> Everybody is jumping all over MuseScore now. And thank goodness, just in time, MuseScore is finally good enough and it sounds oh, yeah. good enough that, that we're all pretty darn satisfied listening to assignments done on MuseScore. So if your students are not in the MuseScore yet, this would be an amazing time to get good at MuseScore. Oh yeah, that's what I used to compose and arrange all of my stuff. The students have things in their folders that I created with MuseScore. Good, excellent. And a lot of the, it'll, the WAV files that it will produce when you have a finished project and you want to just listen to it in the absence of an ensemble sound pretty good compared to the days of Finale Notepad in <laughs> the early 2000s. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. So I guess th those are the main things. Um, the other thing I've just discovered is that um, one should not create video lectures that are very long. Yeah. You know, I mean, if I'm, dis if I'm delivering a, a, like a video lecture that I'm gonna post on the course website, 10 minutes max, because we all have trouble sort of engaging beyond about that. You know, this is why TED Talks are about the length they are, right? And, mm -hmm. and of course, TED Talk people have a certain amount of flash and glitter and they, they've been chosen because they're good presenters and not all of us are not excellent presenters. So good rule of thumb, 10 minutes, see if you can say what you have to say in 10 minutes. Now that's different than a video conference where often the students are very involved. They're, well, there's an interaction. they're talking. So I found that at least at the college level, my students are having no trouble putting up with about an hour uh, video conference. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's hard for me to tell just how checked in or checked out they are. But hey, again, let's face it, we're all grown ups, right? Let's, let's just be responsible, stay checked in. And after about an hour, we're all about exhausted. <laughs> now in some of these formats, uh, Obviously, we're using Zoom right now. Now, I can see you and you can see me, but if you have a classroom of 30 people, who can see who is my question, and can you switch that around? Um, I'm not a Zoom expert yet, but both in Zoom and in Google Hangouts, kind of the other one that we've been experimenting with, um, I can see little pictures of all my students, and the default settings seem to be that um, uh, if one of those little pictures, one of those students says something into their microphone, then the program automatically uh, zooms that person making noise, in other words, talking, up to the big screen. So we see that person talking for as long as they talk. And then afterwards, there's a little pause and maybe somebody else comes in and then they enter the large screen. So it actually works pretty well. Um, I'm sure that in the advanced settings, there are ways, I mean, if I knew I only had six students, probably I could arrange their pictures in you know, a group of six on my screen and maybe we'd all just sit there and look at each other. But you know, I think there are, there are the, the basic default settings seem to be working pretty well. All righty. Uh, my next question here is when you start looking into maybe doing some composing, to what degree do you need to understand music analysis? And does that have to come first or is it kind of a all jumbled together at the same time? 
Well, I think I'm a good example of somebody who began composing as a performer mm -hmm. and knew nothing about theory. I'd never heard of a triad. I didn't know what a harmonic progression was. I couldn't put a Roman numeral underneath the chord to save my life. Um, but I, like any musician who's grown up playing in ensembles, I've got music in my head. And with a certain amount of uh, discipline and energy, I can figure out how to write it down. After all, all of us who play in orchestras or bands have been looking at notation for a long time. And probably we can sort of learn to turn it around and actually write stuff down. This is what in college is called mm -hmm. ear training and or dictation yep. where somebody plays something and you have to learn how to write it down. I discovered when I got to college that I'd been taking dictation for years because I've been <laughs> trying to music, write music off of recordings, right? Because I wanted to play it and I didn't have the sheet music. So, you know, it takes some, some, um, some practice, but uh, that's something we've, you know, maybe this is what we do. We learn to take dictation. So uh, choose, you know, um, some piece of music that you like or that you know, and see if you can figure out how to write it down. That's a, a great exercise for a time like this. You get good at that kind of skill. So this is all a, a sort of a good long introductory way of saying you can begin to compose without a whole heck of a lot of theory. Now, I'm the first to say that I discovered after a while, I too resisted theory as a student because I thought, well, I'm already composing, who needs theory, right? Well, of course, I quickly realized that I was having the trouble that all young composers have, which is to say I could write eight bars. I could, the inspiration would take me about that far, and then I would go, what do I do now? What happens, right? And, and this, of course, is theory is full of all kinds of answers. And so let's differentiate between theory, which we might, is sort of a big word, but let's use it in its small sense, which is to say, understanding what is the harmony here? Mm. What's going on melodically, right? And what, what are the rhythms? And maybe how could I write all that down, right? All of that is sort of theory with a, with a small T, not with a big T. Mm -hmm. And then the other side of that maybe is the word analysis, which you already brought yeah. up. And this gets back to my original point and my kind of original challenge to your students, which is to say, how much do we really understand what's going on in a piece of music? I mean, I realized after I had learned some theory and I heard about things like Sonata Allegro form, which mm -hmm. is a form of a heck of a lot of first movements for about 150 years of music. Um, I realized after I had learned all about that in college that all those years in junior high and high school when I've been playing Beethoven or Mozart or Brahms or Tchaikovsky or whatever, I had been playing Sonata Allegra forms and I didn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what they were. I didn't really know what, what goes on in a piece of music. I didn't realize until I got to college that a piece of music is kind of like a novel right, with different chapters. Mm -hmm. Like a symphony is like a novel and it has different chapters. In the, in the case of a symphony, usually four chapters. We call them movements. But within each of those movements, there is a story, there is a plot. And somebody constructed that very, very carefully in order to take you on this experience of reading this novel. You could use the analogy of a movie. Right, all the all the work that goes into creating a screenplay and all the camera angles and and the casting, who's going to play what character, and what are they going to wear, and where are we going to put them? All these decisions were made so that you could simply go and watch a movie. So yep. you know, essentially, I'm asking you to get interested in how the movie is made or what the author does to write a novel. And I think you, I, I, I should say that there are always students in my classes who raise their hand and say, excuse me, but I don't want to take apart my favorite piece of music. It'll ruin it. And I want to say you are completely wrong. It is going to make Absolutely. your favorite piece of music even more incredible because not only is it gorgeous and it moves you and all the things that we love about our favorite pieces of music, but it's also an astonishing piece of construction. Right? Whoever made that movie or wrote that novel did amazing things. I had this very, this very experience uh, dealing with Mozart. Ah. When I was in Tacoma U Symphony uh, and I was in the Junior U Symphony, it was French year, 
and I loved French Impressionist music. And we did a whole concert of just Mozart during French year. Wow. <laughs> so I was really kind of upset and I didn't, I didn't get it and I kind of got burnt on Mozart. It, you know, he, harmonically speaking, he's not very exotic. Yeah. It's very kind of vanilla harmonies. But then when I got into college and, and some of the, the tricks that I learned from you, uh, I began to understand the genius of Mozart. That he could take some a really simple progression, just a one five one, and put just the right voicing in there with the right affect to really make something that, if nothing else, from an analytical perspective, is genius and beautiful. Yeah, right, exactly. So I, I guess I would encourage your students um, to consider maybe two things at the small scale, theory with a cap with a with a small T. Go online, find yourself some theory website and get them to teach you about triads. And we've already used these chords, one chord, four chord, five chord. What is that stuff, right? Yep. Think how cool it would be if by the end of this semester, when you're disappointed that you're not playing with your friends, you understood basic music theory. You could talk one, four, five chords with your teacher and, and know exactly what both of you were talking about. You could look at a score of Mozart or Beethoven or Tchaikovsky or Chopin and put those Roman numerals underneath it and understand the grammar, understand the construction, understand the genius that makes this music sound so amazing, right? Wouldn't that be a cool thing? It's like learning the secret knowledge that the experts know that we as mere players have never really been invited to explore, right? This could be our semester to sort of discover the secret knowledge behind great compositions. And then how do we take that beyond, you know, these eight bars and understanding this chord progression? And this is the bigger world of analysis. Take yes. apart some piece of music that you like. Maybe it's a Beethoven symphony. Maybe it's the Grieg piano concerto. Maybe it's Night on Bald Mountain. Maybe it's, I mean, it could be, anything it could be a pop song <laughs> right and 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 figure out what what are its let's say sections does it have an introduction does it have a first theme does it have a second theme is there a transition between the first and second theme maybe because it's modulating from one key to another or is there suddenly a double bar with repeat signs that probably tells you this is a sonata allegro form mm -hmm. if so you're probably going to go back and do that first section again the second section is probably where the plot thickens. We call this the development section, right? And then at some point you're gonna notice, oh, the opening is back. That's called the recapitulation. I didn't know any of this when I was merely a bassoonist, but now that I'm a composer, this is like what I make, right? Mm -hmm. So understanding at the larger levels, what's going on in a piece of music? And fortunately, this is getting back to the technology that we have that allows us to do this so beautifully these days, even on our own, YouTube is, of course, absolutely chock full of classical music with scrolling scores. Yep. So you can put on, let me recommend something like the second movement of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. Oh, right? yeah. And it's, an, it's a very slow kind of uh, uh, series of string chords that go on. I, and then, uh, many of my students that are watching, the... Port Angeles High School goes to Carnegie Hall every four years. Nice. The last time they went, my, uh, one of my predecessors, Ron Jones, arranged the second movement of Beethoven 7 with all the wind parts in the strings. Excellent. And so that was one of the pieces they played in Carnegie Hall. So my, my yeah. seniors will know that piece well. Very good. Well, you know, take that a piece apart. Look at what is the chord progression in there. And then, since it's sort of a series of variations over this chord progression, mm -hmm. uh, Take, take a look at, at what are each of those sections? How do they build on each other? If you were to think about how the energy sort of goes up and down over time, you know, what is, that's kind of like the, the excitement of, of a particular area of a plot, or maybe there's kind of a relaxed place in the plot and then it gets thick again, right? Think about what this music is doing to you emotionally and then ask yourself, how does the composer make that happen? Right? So this is analysis. So this isn't just what chords are these? How do I put Roman numerals under things? But this is literally the big question. How does the composer make my experience happen? What instruments do they choose to use? What are the rhythms? What are the textures? 
right? I mean, for instance, is it a tune with a bunch of chords underneath it, the way a pop song is, the way a march is, the way a dance might be? Or is it counterpoint, like a fugue, right, where Bach has all these different tunes sort of weaving around on top of each other simultaneously? That's a very different texture. Mm -hmm. What's the orchestration? right? Uh, compare a Tchaikovsky symphony movement with a Brahms symphony movement. Very different uses of the <laughs> orchestra, right? So all of this is the kind of thing that we can be doing using the technical resources of YouTube to not only listen to anything, but to actually follow the score. This is something else you could think about. You know that your teacher, the conductor, has this big book up there that has everybody's part in it. Have you ever looked at one of those things very carefully? If not, go on YouTube and get good at following these scores and see if you can figure out, oh, what instrument is that? I think it's an oboe. Ah, there's the oboe tune. Oh, now it's in the horn down here. Aha, where are all of these instruments, all right, in, in an orchestral score? So these are, these are, again, things that are so easy for us to do now that we're on our own, we've got sort of unexpected time. We can really dig into the music itself, not just our love of the social activity of making it, but really dig into this thing we all love and figure out what makes this work. And maybe even, and this might be a topic for another session, how could I begin to make my own music? Either for my computer to play on MuseScore, right? I can do that right now, or, when I get back with my friends, could we get together with our instruments and play the music that I wrote during that weird time when we weren't in school? Well, with that invitation on the table, uh, something that I always struggled with as a young composer, like you said, I could write some really cool ideas that were not related to each other. <laughs> so how could we take, and if we can maybe do a demonstration, that would be awesome just a very simple musical idea and maybe de develop it in the most basic of ways. How might I do that if yeah. I'm a student? <clears throat> you know, um, this is probably best done sonically. I don't know if you can see my keyboard over here, but I'll, I'll try to play something. Um, I'm just gonna make something about a whole cloth here, okay? Uh -huh. um, and I'll make it fairly tonal and pleasant because people beginning tend to work with the kind of sounds that they know. But let's just assume that I make up a little motive that goes like this. Oops. <laughs> Might make a help if I turned on some sound. Okay, I'll play it again. I'm gonna do it now. Aha! Now this is starting to sound more like a tune. That minute of music was almost nothing but that little motive that I started with, right? Mm -hmm. And I hope that your students could hear that. Yeah. Um, sometimes it was leaping up and going down. Sometimes it was leaping down and going up. I turn it upside down. So sometimes I take that little bit and I just move it around a little bit, right? So, so what makes our ear identify that motive as the same thing when it's mm -hmm. moving around? Well, I think this gets into the kind of the, the psychology of music perception. And, and the big word for me is pattern, mm -hmm. right? 
music is essentially sonic patterns. So I can take this and then I can move it around. Right? And I can take little pieces of it. Right? That's just a piece of the larger pattern. So taking a bit of music and then analyzing it, this again gets into analysis, <laughs> right? Taking a little bit of music that you just make up on a burst of inspiration the way I did there, <clears throat> and then uh, learning to, to just sort of try moving it around. I think the mistake that beginning composers make is taking a piece of music like that little bit there and doing like two things with it and then saying, well, I guess it's time for something new. Right, and so what you have is a whole bunch of, of different bits of music, none of which are related to each other, and which you invented only because you didn't know what to do with the first one you had. <laughs> <laughs> so again, you know, go back to someone like Bach and listen on YouTube mm -hmm. and figure out, okay, what is the little bit of material that's there? And then just really carefully listen for that bit as it just occurs over and over again all through the music. Right? You can listen again, I mean, again, Beethoven. Right? And then what does that do? <laughs> right? So, so, I mean, it is nothing but that little opening bit over and over and over. Brahms does the same thing. So um, yeah, that's working with these little tiny motives and then turning them into larger things. Mm -hmm. Let me get to another really important element besides the word pattern, which is the word, um, well, I think it's, it's connected with the word phrasing. Mm -hmm. um, how do you build a phrase? Let's say you're thinking melodically. And I think you build a phrase through what composers sometimes refer to as structural pitches. So for instance, if I do this, right on and on, do a deer from Sound of Music. Uh -huh. So the structural pitches are simply the notes that each one of those little melodic bits begins on, right? And um, it turns out that most of the sort of glorious melodies that we like to think about are built on these kinds of structural pitches. Let me give you an example, one of the most sort of sweeping tunes from the 19, what is it, 30s, um, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, right? So listen, listen to this tune. we think about the structural pitches, I'm going to hold each note this time so you're aware of it. So it's just an exhale. <laughs> but a sort of gloriously decorated scale, right? <laughs> uh, so, and, and it's interesting that many, many tunes seem to be built out of downward scales. There's mm -hmm. sort of a sense that, that a resolution of a proper tune is usually a downward resolution and you sort of come to rest. It's almost like gravity, right? The tune is somewhere up here and we know it's at rest when it sort of hits what we call the tonic, right? The home note of the key, and, and it finally sort of sits there, and we think, aha, the tune is done, right? So um, uh, it's interesting to think about some, some tunes that seem to be aspiring to go up. In, oh, let me give you one other example. I'm just looking at my notes here and realizing some of your string players might know the Bach double violin concerto. Oh, yeah. Um, and um, let me just think about... Um, um, Let's see. Um, 
let's see, uh, oh, I'm just drawing a blank here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Sorry, I had a little space moment there. Uh, and <laughs> think about that tune and watch me emphasize with duration the structural pitches. Uh, sorry. Uh, structural pitches, right? So it's sort of a gloriously decorated, uh -huh. slightly chromatic scale, right? And so it's just a, a beautiful example of, of the way a melody is phrased according to these pitches that cause us to know where are we in relationship to that home pitch that we know we're going to, right? I was gonna say there are some melodies that sort of aspire to go up, up, up as long as they can, thereby stretching out a melody. So for instance, um, Danny Boy is a good uh -huh. example. Sort of goes up and back down. Does it again. It goes up. We've never been up here before. <laughs> Do it again. This time. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and then let it gently sort of drift back to its home pitch. Okay, so just an example of how to keep something going, how to keep it up in the air, higher, mm -hmm. higher, higher, for a long time before it finally floats down. There's one more beautiful example of this from um, the uh, Berlioz Symphony Fantastique uh, in the very mm -hmm. first movement where, of course, the whole symphony is a love story, right? And so there's a tune that represents the loved one. Mm -hmm. And it, it goes like this. Watch how long Berlioz manages to keep this tune going. finally drift. Now that's a long, long shaggy dog story of a melody. And he, he keeps it going by just sort of going up, 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 and then finally allowing it to come back down. And when he gets to the fourth and fifth movement, he segments little tiny pieces, all of those, to make that, you know, one, two minutes into a whole hour. <laughs> that's right, exactly. <laughs> so these are just, you know, those are sort of two little first snippet ideas I'm suggesting for students who want to try to compose stuff. Number one, think about pattern. Uh -huh. Use in a very patterned way whatever little bit of material you've come up with to create larger stuff. And as you create the larger stuff, think about those structural pitches and think about how they sort of allow us to understand where we are in the scale of the uh -huh. piece. Are we still up in the air? Are we going up or are we coming down, right? So this, this is the kind of secret knowledge of how music is built that composers use every single day. Um, it's secret knowledge simply because most of us aren't really invited to investigate it, but it's out there. And yeah. maybe, maybe this is the time for you to go find that YouTube video about Roman numeral analysis of triads or about mm -hmm. the analysis of a whole movement 
or about how you could build a melody out of bits of motivic material using pattern and structural pitches and see how long you can carry it out. Well, as we reach sort of the, the denouement here of our conversation, uh, let's say I'm a, a punk 17-year-old violist and uh, everybody has been doing Western music since the 1500s and I know how it works and I'm bored of it. What would be some things to search for ways that other cultures make music? If just some links or maybe some things to search on YouTube, where might I look to see the way that other cultures make music? Sure. I was going to say, even before you step outside of Western culture, check out like the Kronos String Quartet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> K-R-O-N-O-S. And look up how they play uh, Purple Haze by Jimi Hendrix, right? And, and you'll discover viola techniques you didn't know you had. Right, I mean, playing with a sort of a dirty, gritty sound right near the frog, lots of down bows, um, slithering, sliding, letting the bow skate across the, I mean, invent stuff, right? <laughs> um, and then of course, um, the Kronos Quartet is also a great guide into world music because they, more than any other string quartet, have commissioned composers from all over the world to write music for strings which um, uses techniques found in China or in you know, Sub-Saharan Africa or the Middle East using like, you know, microtones. Uh, I mean, all these kinds of things that, that are there. Um, yeah, go on YouTube and, and uh, look up the Chinese Arhu, that's E-R-H-U. And look at how the Arhu, which only has two strings and the bow is actually forever caught between the two strings, which is kind of cool. Um, and how they slide around. We don't tend to slide around very much in Western string technique, um, but, but they do it all the time in, in Chinese music, in Arabic music from the Middle East, um, and of course in blues. I mean, go online and find an old uh, recording of Stefan Grappelli, the jazz violinist from the 40s and 50s, um, and watch him slide around. Why? Because he's a blues player, right? Jazz, blues, uh, violin. So yeah, check out all these all these musical traditions, and this will be a great time to spend some time with your your instrument, uh, looking around for new things you can do. Of course, I uh, you know there's always volume. We've grown up in the world of amplified sound, so maybe check out George Crumb's amplified string quartet called Black Angels. George Crumb, spelled just like C R U M B, and mm -hmm. uh, and turn it up loud and see what a <laughs> rock and roll uh, string quartet can sound like. <laughs> all right, well, I, that's pretty much all the questions that I had for you for this discussion. I think we've opened up a lot of doors for uh, future discussions that might need uh, more focused attention. Uh, is there anything else that uh, you would like to contribute or say to my students during this time of weirdness? Well, I think that we're just all trying to give you ways to stay active, stay, you know, stay feeling like a musician in the absence of your ensemble. And I guess my, the main advice that I've given to my students at PLU is, since we cannot do what we expected to do, um, think of something that we can do during this time period that is within our control and that we might not ordinarily have taken the time to do and will leave us in three months or so, when all this is maybe over, <laughs> leave us looking back on ourselves and feeling terribly proud of ourselves for having accomplished that. You know, maybe it's just learning to take scales and arpeggios seriously and to make them beautiful. Maybe it's learning how to compose, or maybe it's learning new string techniques from other parts of the world, right? I mean, any of these things are absolutely wonderful things to do Choose something that, that is under your control and choose something that's sort of finite so you have a sense of accomplishment, right? Don't say, I'm going to learn to write symphony number one. That's too big. Learn, say to yourself, I'm going to write, <laughs> uh, I'm going to write a viola cello duet for myself and my friend so when I finally see my friend again, we can play this thing, right? And if you manage to pull that off, first of all, you will have learned a ton by doing it about software, about theory, about analysis, all kinds of things. And you will feel really proud of yourself that you now can do that. I mean, my gosh, when I first discovered that I could compose, I thought the world had cracked open and it was a completely different place. It was kind of like, wow, I can write music. It's like a whole new world. 
right? That was my discovery. That may or may not be yours, but take this time to explore music itself, not just the social activity of performing it, and see what you discover about this glorious art form and, and how you too can participate even more in the making of beautiful music. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Utes, for this uh, conversation and all of the answers that you had for us during this really uncertain time. I think my students have plenty to work on now. Uh, I'm sure we'll have some questions to throw your way, uh, but that more or less wraps up this discussion. I wanna thank you so much for your time and, and all of your expertise. It has been my pleasure. Good luck to you and your students. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.